This book is a hybrid, if you will, memoir, science book, and policy. What I thought I'd do here today was to focus a little bit on the science, why I wrote the book. Um, I've been studying drugs for about 22, 23 years. And one of the things that I contend in the book is that there have been some assumptions made about drugs that are false. Um, bad, and that has led to bad drug policy. And so I think I'll talk about one component of what I highlight in the book. Uh, and that component, what I'd like to talk about is the work or the science that I've been doing and other people have been doing with methamphetamine. Back in 2005, I got a call from the Office of National Drug Control Policy asking me to participate in a round table of writers who were interested in writing stories about methamphetamine. They wanted their stories to be more realistic. They were writers for things like Law and Order, CSI, magazines, and so forth. Uh, at this round table, we had uh, participate, the, the panelists were a U.S. assistant attorney, an undercover narcotics officer, an adult person who was addicted to methamphetamine, an adolescent who was addicted to uh, methamphetamine, and myself. Uh, my role at the panel was to help participants understand where the science was at the time, uh, what we knew from the empirical information. And so I proceeded to summarize what we knew. Basically what I said was that we had, at the, up to that point, we had tested relatively low oral doses in the laboratory where we gave to people and we evaluated the effects of those doses of methamphetamine on cognitive performance, mood, heart rate, blood pressure, those sorts of things. And my conclusions were that the drug was quite unremarkable. In fact, in people who are well rested, you didn't see much in terms of cognitive disruptions. You didn't see any. Um, uh, those, those low doses produce some euphoria, but uh, moderate range of euphoria. Um, when I finished my presentation, my fellow panelists were horrified. They were horrified because they had told stories about the horrors of methamphetamine that they saw in the natural ecology. They recounted stories of methamphetamine users developing superhuman strength. When someone was on methamphetamine, it was said that you had to increase the caliber of weapon. Uh, regular tasers no longer worked with these, these individuals. Another story that was recounted was that uh, methamphetamine was like no other drug that law enforcement had ever seen. Uh, this particular uh, cop said he had more than 20-something years of experience uh, on the force and had never seen anything like methamphetamine, and he had seen crack users and that sort of thing. So this drug, methamphetamine, he claimed, uh, exerted unique pharmacological effects. Finally, when I challenged uh, some of the claims that were being made, he turned to me and he said, Dr. Hart, when you see a parent cut the head of their child off and throw it at you, then maybe perhaps you will become a believer. So the idea was that this parent was so cognitively impaired, she cut the head off of her kid and threw it at this cop. Now, I tried to explain that um, these types of stories, these anecdotes, particularly about drugs, they weren't new. We had heard them before. The stories about drug users developing superhuman strength, the stories about some new drug uh, being like no other drug we've ever seen, and the stories about drugs causing this sort of, uh, this wide range of cognitive disruptions. What I'd like to do here in the next few minutes is just evaluate or look at these three sort of claims that seem to be pervasive in our history when it comes to drugs. Um, the first, uh, these individuals developing superhuman strength. At this round table, I tried to explain that this wasn't new. If you go back to the New York Times, for example, on February 8th, 1914, what you find there is a huge editorial 
uh, Negro cocaine fiends are a new Southern menace. In this piece, he argued that black people, when they have cocaine, they develop superhuman strength, so much so that Southern police forces had to increase the caliber of their weapons. They moved from the 32 caliber weapon to the 38 caliber weapon because the 32 caliber weapon or bullets didn't affect black people on cocaine. <laughs> I know it sounds comical, but this was actually believed. And these things come back in new forms. If you all think about maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, we heard about the guy in Miami who uh, chewed the face off of, of another guy. The officer believes the man clearly, clearly was on some very, very powerful drugs. It was said that the person was on bath salts, and bath salts uh, cause such extreme effects that you get this kind of behavior. But when the toxicology was in, we looked at what was in the person's system, there was no bath salts in this person's system. The only thing that was in the person's system was THC. And THC, we don't know when was the last time this person had used THC. It could have been weeks. But the point is, is that these arguments, these claims, um, they are recycled generation after generation. And we laugh at some of them because of the language. But the language is tempered for, to fit the contemporary folk, where it doesn't seem so outrageous if you're not a critical thinker. But, uh, but of course, most of these claims are um, just exaggerations. The other claim that methamphetamine produces unique cognitive effects, or unique effects in general, I hadn't collected any evidence to address this claim. Uh, but what I did, along with my PhD student at the time, Matt Kirkpatrick, we ran a study in which we gave uh, research participants, of course we passed all of the ethical requirements. Uh, we gave research participants intranasal methamphetamine at a low dose and a large dose uh, on one day, but it's all on the blind conditions. And we gave them D-amphetamine, the active ingredient in Adderall, on other days. And we evaluated the effects of these drugs. Of course, placebo was included. We evaluated the effects of these drugs to see whether or not the methamphetamine was unique uh, compared to just regular amphetamine. Because when you look at the chemical structure of these drugs, they look almost identical, excepting for the uh, methyl group that's on the methamphetamine structure. But they are nearly identical. And what we found was that the drugs produced nearly identical effects. They are the same drug. Methamphetamine is the same drug as the active ingredient in Adderall. And so the notion that methamphetamine uh, produces unique effect is just simply not supported by evidence from research. Uh, we weren't the first people to do that. Other folks had done, had, had, had done this sort of thing with oral uh, methamphetamine compared to oral D-amphetamine. Finally, uh, I was interested in um, this notion that methamphetamine causes all of these cognitive disruptions. If you all have been paying attention in the country for the past, oh, five to 10 years, you might know something about the Montana Meth Project, in which they make these slick advertisement, which they call education, um, about methamphetamines or the dangers of methamphetamines. And oftentimes, these advertisements uh, indicate that methamphetamine causes uh, widespread cognitive disruptions. And then it seemed as though the scientific literature was in support of what was being said in these advertisements. So what I did in 2012, I published a review of all of the scientific literature that was relevant for cognitive performance and for brain imaging. What I concluded was this. The scientific interpretation or the interpretations in the scientific literature were wildly overstated in terms of the effects of methamphetamine on cognition, in terms of the effects of methamphetamine on brain structure. Now, 
I wish I was the first person to do this sort of thing, to really call into question the exaggerations. But since we are here at Reason, I have to give props to Jacob Solomon. Jacob had been writing about this for some period. The vast majority of people who use illegal drugs are not addicts, are not heavy users, and they're not uh, posing any kind of threat to other people, well, nor, nor are they harming themselves. That's, well, that's your opinion. I don't know if it's that's It's not just true. opinion. This is based upon data well, that's available from the federal government. If you look at patterns of use, you'll you can see... Spin any, you can spin data any way you want. No, this we is got quite plain. Hey, Mr. Solomon, this is a yeah. discussion, all right? Don't get in Thanks. a car and don't come near my family. If you want to see a scientific paper on this, my paper was published in Neuropsychopharmacology in 2012, and you can actually see it for yourself. So given that we have assumptions our drug policy is based on these faulty assumptions. One of the things that I call for in high price is that we should rethink, reevaluate how we are regulating drugs like methamphetamine, drugs like heroin, drugs like cocaine, and so forth. And the main reason I call for this reevaluation is this. Each year in this country, we arrest 1.5 million people for drug-related violations. More than 80% of them are for simple possession. Now, if our assumptions that these, that these drugs are so dangerous, we have to go after them with such ferocity, are faulty, I think that we could decrease the blemishes that we put on people's records by decriminalizing drugs rather than the approach that we're taking.